Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. <laughs> you hear that? Clearly, it's the top of the hour where I'm at. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 20. This is a special episode because it's about the blue antelope. <laughs> I've mentioned him before in other episodes and I've mentioned my spiritual mentor many times and I think that now is the time for me to tell you about him and... the days that I spent with him and how it turned into a seven-year mentorship. Seven years. I, I don't think that my story can properly be told without him. It was a chance occurrence that happened. It just doesn't happen to everyone. And I'd like to share that. But in order to get to that incredible day in 2012... I need to go back to before I was born. My parents, uh, my, my mother comes from a Jewish family, and my dad comes from a Protestant family. And back then, in the early 70s, it was considered uh, a, a not good thing for a, for a, a, a Jew to marry a non-Jew. So... When my parents got serious and they decided to get married, my you know they they had a talk and my dad agreed to raise the kid Jewish, even though he didn't really care. He was more agnostic, still is. Agnostic, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of it's like a skeptical thing. It's like they believe in a higher power, but you kind of got to show them, you know, <laughs> like if God showed up. They'd have to ask for God's ID identification, right? Show me your driver's license. <laughs> Agnostics are skeptics, but they're not all the way non-believers like an atheist. So anyway, they decided to raise me Jewish. But I had Christmas and Easter on the other side of the family. So I grew up very confused. I would go to Sunday school and I would ask my dad on the way home, why am I doing this? And, you know, he would, I don't remember his answers, but I think he was sort of, uh, as part of the deal, so to speak. Uh, by the time I got to grade school, man, I, I, I felt like an outcast. You know, this is a Christian country, so all the teachers do Christmas activities every December. And uh, Easter every spring. And so they would try to make me and this other girl, she was Jewish, she was all the way Jewish, try to feel welcome. So they would like do Hanukkah exercises too and stuff like that. But what it did was is it made us stand out. And what do kids do? They pick on you. So I was constantly called Jew boy and dreidel boy and stuff like that. And I didn't like it because I had Christmas too. So I'd be like, hey guys, chill, man. I got, I got Santa Claus too. Because <laughs> I did. I went over to my aunt's every year. I had gifts underneath the Christmas tree. I had, you know, stockings. I, I, I had everything that you could think of. Just like a regular American kid. But I also had Hanukkah and yada yada. And then... As I got to be around 11, 12, it became bar mitzvah time. <laughs> and this is a really big thing. And I had to learn Hebrew and I had to learn all this stuff. And it was overwhelming for a 12-year-old kid. And I never could understand why I was doing it. I was embarrassed. I don't mean any disrespect to anyone that's Jewish. But I just, I was embarrassed. And I, I didn't know how to be proud of it. I didn't understand it. 
by the time I turned 18 and I went to college, I denounced my religion immediately. Told my mom, I'm sorry, I'm not Jewish anymore. I was actually inspired by Muhammad Ali because he was a Christian man who converted to Islam <laughs> and changed his name and everything. And he's like, I was like, if he can change, I can change, right? So I did. That's what I did. And um, you know, my mom wasn't happy about that. And I think my dad was smiling on the inside about that. Like, yeah, he's got a mind of his own type thing, you know. Um, but I, I, uh, I carried that resentment. And not only did I denounce my religion, but I found all the pictures of my bar mitzvah. And I threw them out. I don't even think my parents even know because they're, they're not organized people. So <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if they even know. But I did. That's how embarrassed I was. I just like, I want it out. I don't want to be a part of this thing anymore. And um, of course, my friends and family still referred to me as Jewish, which would upset me. Because I didn't know. Was that a nationality? Is it a religion? What is it? <laughs> so anyway, my whole 20s, I was kind of like my dad. I was an agnostic. And I wasn't into religion. I thought religion was BS. I was not a spiritual person. In fact, I was into like the, you know, I was into, you know, science and aliens and stuff like that. And, you know, I was I was into all that type of stuff, all that alternative type of stuff. In my late 20s, I became a little more in tune because I was getting my health in order after my health scare. And I, I learned about the pineal gland. And transmitting frequencies. And I started learning about fasting. Fasting was a really big thing. And of course, if you learn about fasting, you're going to learn some Jesus, some Buddha, some Muhammad, because fasting has been around forever. So I started getting my health in order. I started turning my life around. I, I went vegan. And so I learned a little bit about Buddha and what karma is and stuff like that. But, you know, not all the way. Then something happened. I think I was 31. I had a kid who was part of my radio show at the time. I was I was on the radio at a station called Hot 93.7, hip hop and R&B, and uh, I had a popular radio show. And our thing was YouTube. We posted all our material on YouTube, and well, we did pretty well. And. You know, all the interviews you can think of, you know, Drake and LL Cool J and Nas and Keisha Cole and just all these interviews that I worked for. Because in radio, interviews aren't just thrown on your lap unless you're either in a morning show or, or you're, you know, Howard Stern or The Breakfast Club or something, you know. So you have to really hustle for these interviews. Go to concerts, talk to people, get backstage. You have to be like a groupie almost to get these dang interviews. And then once you get them, you got to, you know, you got to like really come through with a good interview so that they know you for next time and you build those relationships. It's a lot of work, a lot of energy. Eventually, I wanted to, I wanted out. So I, 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 I dissolved the show, essentially. There was five of us. And I said, I didn't want to do this anymore. I was going to start going by my government name. And I had a plan to leave radio, like retire. And I had like a two-year plan. But I didn't want to do the show anymore. So some people got salty, including an intern. And this intern really, really got salty. So this 19-year-old kid who's been loyal to me for five, six years, maybe even seven years, he <laughs> he got mad at me. And one day I logged into my, I don't remember what it was, my Twitter or something, and I couldn't log in. And the picture was changed. And there were tweets coming out, assassinating my character, that looked like it was coming from me. My email was gone. Um, I don't remember if my Facebook was hacked too. Uh, Instagram wasn't around back then. And the worst part was the YouTube channel was gone. 
it was gone. It was there, but there was no videos. <laughs> All that work, 10 years worth of work was gone. This 19-year-old kid had my codes because that was his job, social media. He hijacked my whole, my, my whole social media. Um, changed the password so I couldn't get in and just it was just a blindside attack and wow hard to describe what that feels like when you're when I, I worked so hard to build a reputation in, in, in and in a career in entertainment and now it was being assassinated. He wouldn't answer the phone. Wouldn't answer the text. And when one of our other producers reached out to him, he just he said why he was doing it, and then and then just stopped talking. And so he was accusing me of something that I didn't do. Still to this day, I have no reason to lie to you. What he was accusing me of, I did not do. It was a misunderstanding. But yet, he decided to attack in such a vicious way. You know, if I was guilty of anything, perhaps it was of, of not being grateful for his efforts. And maybe he was holding resentment. And he, he just... He went after what meant the most to me, my career... And then if that's not enough, I had a girlfriend at the time who was very sickly. And um, the stress made her blood pressure shoot up and she ended up being sedated. And it was like, so he was attacking my career and my lady. And that sent me into a spiral of anger like I've never experienced before. My ego was attacked. My ego was like, how dare you? Do you know who the F I am? <laughs> I mean, I was K Dubbis' running this. Like, you gotta understand that. I was a public figure. I was I was uh equivalent to I don't know. Uh, your your six o'clock news anchor, or you know, your local weatherman. I was a local. I was a local figure, and this kid was attacking my work, my woman, my ego, with no real explanation, and it was false. It was for no reason. It's like being falsely accused. I went into a dark place. I tried calling the cops. Cops couldn't do nothing. Back then, there was no protocol. You see, now they would do something because there's protocol. You wouldn't even need the cops now. People get hacked or hijacked all the time. But back then, social media was still a pretty new thing. And the cops didn't know what to do. They are like, uh, I don't know. So you're saying he had your passwords like yeah he was my intern of course he had my passwords I had some clout in the streets I was a gun owner and my mind definitely went to those places revenge seemed like the best medicine I remember plotting planning strategizing it's dark man dark and uh, I remember my legs were so tense from the stress and 
from pacing. I was doing a lot of pacing. And I remember just my legs giving out on me. Just falling on my couch. And then something happened. I can't explain it. I sort of separated from my my body and my thoughts. My true self became noticeable, I guess you could say. And I uh, had this unbelievable calm come over me. Just like, whew. And I, I felt bliss. I was blissed out. It was unbelievable. And I... Uh, It didn't last long, <laughs> but it was enough. I stopped caring. I didn't care about the YouTube page anymore. I didn't care about anything. And, and, and obviously I was worried about my girlfriend, but I forgave the kid. I was like, I have a 19-year-old kid. He doesn't know any better. So I had this experience, and it went away. And then... I got sucked right back into the world of entertainment, like most people do, showbiz. Ambition is a disease. And it was right back to the races. Go, 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 go. Get it done, get it done, get it done. I found a way to get my YouTube channel back, and I got my Twitter page back, and I got everything back, and no harm, no foul. My girlfriend ended up being okay, you know. But it was a really dark and stressful I think it lasted around a week, five five to seven days of just whew, crazy. And uh, but I I came out of this experience a seeker. I said, what what was that that I experienced, and how do I get it back? For the first time in my life, I became a spiritual seeker. I could have became a seeker when I was younger, doing the Judaism stuff or. You know, and, but I didn't, I was a health seeker because at this time I was, I was just getting my health in order and I was, I was, um, going to health school to become a health coach and, uh, the PhD came later, but I, I was turning the corner into a new career and a new way of life. But this made me a real deal spiritual seeker. So I started going down rabbit holes. I started with Gotama, the Buddha, real name Siddhartha, Gotama. And when I was done with him, I went to Jesus Christ. And then, I, you know, I went to Don Juan Matus and Osho and Patanjali and a whole bunch of others. And I came to this realization that truth is truth. The universal truth. It's, it's all the same. They just all taught different ways, but they taught the same thing, essentially. So I, I enhanced my meditation and stuff like that and just kept studying and becoming a scholar, if you will. Then uh, and one of my buddies who was out in California at the time, he uh, he retreated to an ashram for like 10 days or something. It was Yogananda's ashram, if you're familiar with Yogananda. And I was like, ashram? What the heck is that? I didn't know what that was. So I did some research, and I was like, wow, this is cool. And I found one here um, right in New York, Monroe, New York, called Ananda Ashram. And uh, I I signed up for a week retreat. Go down, go down there, see what's up, and drove down there for two uh, two and a half hours. And I walked in, registered, and I went to my dorm room. 
I was I was anxious. Like, who am I going to room with? Who, you know? And uh, uh, the office told me I only have one roommate. I was like, all right, okay, that's cool. And so I, I, I go to check out the dorm, and, and he was walking out as I was walking in, I believe. And he uh, welcomed me. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could tell that he, he'd been there before. And I, and he was just like, oh, you know, if you have any questions, let me know, blah, blah, blah. But we were, we were going in separate directions, so I was like, all right, well, I'll see you later. I could sense something was different about him, just very compassionate, you know? So I went out with my day exploring the, the campus. Just imagine like a huge, almost like a campground. On a, by a lake and you take your shoes off for every building and there's different activities like a wellness center it's a spiritual community wellness center where you can live for a short period of time or the day or the year whatever I went to a meditation they had it twice a day and they did chanting and some Sanskrit stuff the original language and so that threw me off I wasn't used to it well, when I got back to the dorm later on, like 9 p.m.-ish, um, the roommate came walking in. In fact, um, instead of telling you, I'm just going to read my diary. I, I kept a diary that week, so let me just go right to that. I went back to my dorm and got into bed around 9.30 p.m. I was exhausted and relaxed. Soon walked in my roommate. Since he worked at the ashram, I took it as a great opportunity to get questions answered. I went into Barbara Walters mode. I asked why he wasn't in the meditation session. He humbly let me know that he'd rather meditate alone. He had his own practice. After I inquired, he used the analogy of the sky. He said that the sun was the connection to your consciousness, but some people have clouds. He said that those that meditate those meditate sessions are usually lower level meditators and have lots of clouds that block the sun and he prefers to go upstairs in the temple area and meditate on his own. I love the analogy he gave. It made sense. He said he's been meditating for 15 years and he encouraged me to keep going and I will one day know what he's talking about. I kept asking questions. I asked him how old he was and he didn't really know. Let me stop there. <laughs> Let me stop there. Uh, yeah, he. I remember this. He whipped out his fingers and started counting. <laughs> I was like, how do you not know how old you are? He's like, yeah. He's like, I think I'm 38, 39. <laughs> like, really? Who are you? Uh, he didn't have a cell phone. I, I was asking a lot of questions, being a seeker. And I think he could tell that I was a seeker, you know. He, t he told me the chanting raised vibrations and, you know, that's kind of what started the conversation because I was thrown off by it. You know, we talked for a while and I could tell he, he just had so much knowledge of everything and I couldn't stop asking questions. Fast forward to around 4.30 the next morning, he accidentally woke me up. He was getting out of bed, and I was jumpy because I'm not used to sleeping in the same room with someone, you know, four or five feet away from me. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go back to sleep, you know. So my expectation is that he's going to use the bathroom or something, and he'll be back. He never came back. Well, he did. Three hours later, maybe even four hours later, he came back climbed back in the bed and went to sleep like automatic like a like a like a switch i'm like what the heck where did he go later on the next day i ran into him and i'm like where'd you go man well what was that all about and he's like oh you know i uh i get up with the sun every day and i go do my prayers and meditation i'm like for real with the sun I'm like what about you know, different times of the year. He's like, yeah, well, I'll just coordinate it. Get up at different times. I'm like, but what if you're tired? He's like, oh, I'll go back to sleep. 
I'm like, what? I had never seen witness such discipline, you know? It's almost like he was a spiritual version of a Navy SEAL. I'm going to give you a military analogy, right? It's like, just pretend you met a Navy SEAL one day, but you didn't know he was a Navy SEAL. Like, you were rooming with a Navy SEAL, but you didn't know it. You asked mad questions, you found out, you got mad stories, and you saw the type of discipline, right? That's what I was witnessing, but from a spiritual perspective, you know. And I was just astounded by his knowledge. He knew the Bible in and out. He knew Jesus in and out. He knew Muhammad in and out. The Quran in and out. He knew Buddha and Buddhism in and out. He knew, you know, yoga in and out. I ain't talking about the physical exercises. I'm talking about yoga, the tradition. He, he, he knew it all. He knew Gandhi, Martin Luther King. We talked about all this stuff, just society and how the mind works and ego and what it is. And um, I just went down these rabbit holes with him. He took me there. And I finally asked him, I'm like, what are you? Because you seem to know so much about so much. So are you Christian? Are you Muslim? And he was like, well, I don't really like labels. But if you have to give me a label, I'm a mystic. I'm like, a mystic? What the? I'm like, I'm from Connecticut. You know, we know about Mystic Pizza, Mystic Aquarium. <laughs> what the heck is a mystic? So he just chuckled. I had to look it up. And uh, I'll tell you the definition. A person who seeks by contemplation and self-surrender to obtain unity with or absorption into the absolute or who believes in the spiritual apprehension of truths that are beyond the intellect. So essentially, essentially is a mystic is a word for someone who has gone beyond, you know, their inner science, their mastering or have mastered their inner science. There can be Christian mystics, there's Sufi mystics, there's lots of different types of mystics. But if generally if someone's just a mystic, they're not following a certain tradition, so to speak. He taught me all sorts of things. He said there's there's many different ways to get the 42nd street <laughs> that's funny because he's from new york city i'm from harford i've been to new york plenty, enough times in my career to know 42nd street and it was a good analogy he's saying to get to the top of your inner potential your spirituality you can go through christianity you can go through islam you can go through buddhism you can you can you can do all different types of ways to get there there's no one type of way because the truth will come back. It'll always come back to the way you use your mind. It'll always come back to dissolving the ego. It'll always come back to staying in the present moment. It'll always come back to these foundational teachings. One of the other teachings that has stuck with me is your practice will protect you. Practice. We're talking about practice. <laughs> what are you saying? No matter what happens in your life, whether you're going through a bad breakup or someone close to you dies or your house burns down or, you know, your job is super stressful, whatever happens to you in your life, you keep coming back to your practice. He's saying your practice will protect you no matter what. Like I always say, you got to practice if you want to be in the NBA, right? You can't just join the NBA. You can't get to the top of the mountain without practice. Going back to my diary here. Um, he considered himself a mystic who learned from all gurus without following any particular religion. We started talking about the ashram. He informed me that it is a retreat for most people that lots of people came to escape society, yet they end up doing the same types of things. He asked me what I wanted out of this. I told him personal enrichment and vacation from society. He told me to look closely, and I will find the real ashram inside of the retreat. 
it made sense. After viewing all the people and noticing some weren't spiritual and noticing some to seem unhealthy, it all came together. You get out of it what you put into it. You can come and you can treat it like a campground retreat or a vacation from society or do as he does and treat it like an ashram or monastery. I wanted to treat it like an ashram or monastery, even though my business mind wanted to interview people and make videos and tell the managers about my health coaching business and radio show and try to network. I felt very conflicted. He said if society falls apart, it won't affect him because he isn't caught up in the world. We spoke more on the Buddha and Gandhi and I asked him an important question. When did you kill your ego? He smiled then went into explanation. He said his old ego, the one he visualized for himself, may be dead, but the scars always remain, just like a bad burn. He said the karma impact is always there, and the memory is always there. I told him about my ego and how I'm in nutrition school. I told him it's hard to learn all this health info and study the spirituality like I would like. He said maybe the health is going to be my contribution to the world. After the convo, he left to break his fast from Ramadan and he went to meditate. I missed my meditation session because of my conversation with him, but I didn't regret it. You see, he was working there. He was doing like a what's called a, uh, a residency. So he did housekeeping. In return, he got room and board. And they let him do his own thing because they knew he was an advanced meditator, so to speak. He wasn't at the beginning stages like most people who come and do a little work-study program. So I thought it was interesting. And here's this guy, and I would watch him. Because I'm a guest. I'm walking around campus. I'm, you know, being a guest. And there, I, there he is, you know, taking out the garbage, cleaning toilets, cleaning windows. And he's in the present moment. And you can tell he's just, boom, on his task. Doing his seva, which means service. And nobody knows that he's a mystic. <laughs> and how would they know? I could tell he didn't talk. He only spoke when spoken to or if absolutely necessary. He was in silence. The only way I know is because I got stuck in a dorm room with him. Now get this. He wasn't supposed to be in the dorm room because he's doing residency. He's supposed to be in the staff building. But the staff building, they were having repairs or something. Something brought him over to the dorm room. It's a complete chance encounter. If I came a week earlier or a week later, or he came a week earlier or a week later, we would have never met outside of a high and by, maybe. Not in the manner that we did. And he took me down rabbit holes, man. They say when the student is ready, the teacher appears, right? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. It was amazing. One day, he uh, he was doing maintenance on his hair because he had dreadlocks. So he went outside. This is in July. It's nice out. And uh, he said, you can join me if you'd like. Of course I did. I went out. I asked him. I said, why do you think this world is so complicated? He replied, it's not to me anymore. <laughs> I happened to be reading a book that I, I found there in the library at the ashram. It was called In My Soul I Am Free. It was sort of an autobiography of Paul Twitchell. This book had me hooked like no book had ever hooked me before. And uh, it was about what's called soul travel, astral projection. And so here I am learning something brand new 
from this book that just knocked me over. And I had the, I had a mystic right next to me. So, of course, I'm going to ask questions. So I asked him. And he was like, yeah, Jesus and Muhammad both spoke of this technique in the Bible and the Quran. I was like, wow. I started putting things together. Later that night, I tried the technique for the first time while laying in bed with a sleep mask on. <laughs> no luck, except I kept seeing a lightened dot around my pineal. And it slowly moved up and down. Later, when I went to bed, I actually felt something. My body became warm and tingly. And I heard almost a crackling of frequencies in my left ear. Almost like a radio static when you flip through stations. You know, the old-fashioned way. I woke up very startled. <laughs> the blue antelope was on the other side of the room, just getting ready for bed. And he turned. I told him what I felt. And he said, what you heard is called the unstruck sound. And he hears it often. He said it comes when your consciousness reaches a certain state in meditation. He told me to be patient and go at my own pace. His advice calmed me down and I went back to sleep. The next day I woke up 33 years old. I made sure my, my phone was off. I've told this story on the podcast before. I... I didn't want any praise for my birthday, nothing. This was, I was retreating for a reason. I was on a spiritual journey, man. Nobody knew it was my birthday. And you know how on Facebook you get all that birthday love. I didn't want none of it. It's funny, man, you know. I, my whole life, I always looked up to entertainers and media moguls like Jay-Z and Vince McMahon and Howard Stern and guys like this, Walt Disney. And then I meet the Blue Antelope. <laughs> and I'm like, this guy, I'd rather be like him than like them. I'm like, do you ever get angry? He's like, no. <laughs> he transcended, man. He transcended the society through incredible discipline. I was so impressed by him. I was like, hey, man, you know, do you have a YouTube channel? You got to have a YouTube channel. I was like, what about a Facebook page? He's like, man, I don't even have a cell phone. Huh? <laughs> He's like, I'm not concerned with any of that. I'm like, come on, man. People need to know. People need to know what you have to say. You can teach the world so much. He just giggled and smiled and waved it off. I don't think so. That's one of the reasons why I don't even use his real name. When I refer to him, because I don't even know if he wants his name said. You know? I call him the Blue Antelope because that was the name of his website. He had a little, no disrespect, rinky-dink website where he just kept his work. You know? And it's just like whoever found it, found it. A lot of Rumi stuff. Jalaluddin Rumi, the Sufi mystic from the 13th century. A lot of Rumi stuff. He would... Uh, analyze his his poems and he would um, give commentary on them. He also had essays on Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And he had poetry. He did poetry. Um, during the day, sometimes while he's out there working, doing housekeeping, he would stop into the dorm room and uh, he would read for like 10 minutes, standing up, like on the top bunk. He's a tall dude, so he would just keep the book on the top bunk and just read for like 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> I remember one time he was teaching a meditation class at the ashram because they would let him do that every now and again. And it was me and another person. It was a great class. And afterwards, I'm like, man, wouldn't you rather there have been 200 people instead of two people? He's like, ah, it doesn't matter to me. One of the things he taught me was never get attached to the results. Mm. It's hard to do, man. Never get attached to the results. 
I wanted to promote him. I was so excited. It's like I found a mystic with all this knowledge. He was a walking library. And and not only did he have knowledge, he wasn't just a scholar. He lived it, man. He had transcended. I wanted to, like, do show and tell, you know. I met this guy. I got to show you, you know. It's like he belonged in the Himalaya Mountains or something. But he didn't want any of it. I ended up interviewing him, though, later on. Um, for my clients, I had health clients and I wanted to teach them meditation. I figured why me teach them, let them, let him do it. So I interviewed him and recorded it. And that was even hard to get him on the phone to do that. You know, he doesn't have a phone, so we had to coordinate it to get on the landline at the ashram and, you know, we did it and, uh, it ended up becoming a part of my book, Diet De-Stress Detox. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. He just doesn't want any, any praise. I remember one time, because I ended up coming the next year also to meet with him. I had to see him again. He was like the guru on campus and nobody knew. <laughs> Even though he wasn't a real guru because he wasn't a teacher. He didn't want to have disciples. He didn't want to have students. He was just a wandering mystic who... You know, if a student appeared, he would, like me, he would he would give what was needed, right? So we roomed together for six days. And uh, just a chance encounter, man. Just unbelievable. The stuff he taught me. But the biggest thing he taught me was not with words. It was with example. I could smell the fragrance of a compassionate human being with no ego. <laughs> you just don't run into that every day. He was a role model to the 10th degree. And it didn't have anything to do with money. It didn't have anything to do with possessions. It was what he had achieved by finding his original face, his true self. At the end of my stay, I asked him, like, how can I stand? I mean, you don't have a phone, but how do I stay in contact with you? So he had an email, you know, to keep up with family. So we exchanged emails. I emailed him for seven years. <laughs> and he responded for seven years. And just like in that dorm room, I asked a ton of questions. Before I pressed record on this, I uh, opened my computer and went back to the emails because I was curious how many there were. There was 22 threads. 22 threads. Some of those threads are only, you know, four emails. Some of those threads are 12 emails. You know what I mean? Like just a whole entire topic if I went through things, I would email them. If I had questions about spirituality, I would email him. And he was so kind and generous with his time. <laughs> and the first few years, he would... Because he only checked his email, you know, once a week, maybe once every two weeks, right? He just... Not seven times a day like a normal person. And he would... uh He'd be like, hey, you know, I can't answer back right now, but I'll be sure to get this as soon as I can. <laughs> so I had to, eventually, I, I, I saw the pattern, so I had to start at the bottom of my email saying, hey, just get back to me when you get time. And that cut down on the emails. <laughs> I have them all. I have 22 threads. I copy and pasted them into a Word document so I can read them over and over and over again because there's so much information and knowledge. It could easily be a book. Easily be a book. I also visit him the following year in 2013. I went down to the ashram and he made time for me, sit down with me. I remember one conversation we had about 
girls. <laughs> I don't remember how it came up. Obviously, I'm the one that brought it up because he never brought up anything. He never had anything to say. I had to bring up everything. <laughs> it was one-sided, man. <laughs> he spoke in silence. Unless you ask him a question. And I asked. I said, uh, I must have said something about a girl, but I remember me talking about big booties. <laughs> I don't remember how it came up, but... You know, he's from New York. I'm from Hartford. It's pretty much the same kind of culture. And I'm like, what about, you know, what about girls? Bah, 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 bah. Like, how you know, sometimes you see a girl and she's, you know, shaped like this and she's beautiful and you just want to. And he's like, look, man, it's flesh. It's a body. It's going to disintegrate. If you find a, a a woman you're into, you have to find one. It has to go. It has to be beyond flesh, because that flesh, that beautiful woman, is going to be old and wrinkled and gray one day. I remember that. We had many talks. I also visited him when he was doing his roomy circles. He would do these events. The ashram would let him do. They they would give him the auditorium. And he would pay tribute to Jalaladin Rumi by reading some of the some of his work and by chanting in Arabic. This dude would chant in Arabic and it was beautiful. And it like raised the vibration of the room. I'm like, wow, wow. I could tell he had a connection to Jalaladin Rumi. I later found out seven years later. That Rumi was his master. And that's when I realized you can have a master that's been dead for centuries. <laughs> now this is some Obi-Wan Kenobi stuff right now, right? <laughs> that's what you're thinking? Some Star Wars stuff? Where do you think George Lucas got all this stuff from? Hmm? George Lucas borrowed from the Zen masters and the Sufi masters and so on and so forth. The Force is the Tao. But you know that maybe that's another topic for another episode. The roomy circles that the Blue Antelope did were unbelievable. And I have some on tape. Maybe I'll play it for you. So you can hear his voice. <laughs> I'm just so thankful to have met a mystic who was kind enough to help me out for seven years and help me in my journey. When I um, started getting serious about my practice, I uh, had some mystical experiences. Guess who I emailed right away? <laughs> who else am I going to go to? My doctor? My parents? My friends? No. And go right to the mystic. My mentor. I don't consider him my guru or my master because he wasn't walking the path of a guru or master. Gurus and masters, they have students and disciples. And this guy was, he was a wandering mystic. Sort of reminded me of Diogenes. Have you ever heard that story? I told it on the Ego episode of this podcast. Diogenes and Alexander the Great. I told that story. Kind of reminds me of that. Or Shams. Shams was the, was the, the mentor of Jalaluddin Rumi. Maybe that's why he helped me. Maybe he identified with that story. Because like Shams, he ended up disappearing. <laughs> One day I emailed him and he emailed back and he said, I'm paraphrasing, he said, uh, I'm going away. 
And I'm not sure if I'm coming back. And uh, if you want to continue this journey together, then you have to do it in silence. Because <laughs> he said, the essence of everything I've told you came from silence. So if you want to access it, you have to go silent. And that was that. That was in May 2019. I think it was right after I did the Inner Peace Seminar. The start of this podcast. <laughs> go figure. So that was that. He's gone. I don't know if I'll ever speak to him or see him ever again. But I sure am thankful. Because this type of experience doesn't happen to everyone. And I try to share these experiences through this podcast. So that they may help you. Or inspire you. Or at the very least entertain you. You know, here I was, very much a non-seeker, right? Couldn't stand the religion that was handed to me. I was upset, resentful. Denounced my religion. Then had a dark, dark experience with revenge on my mind. That something happened, and then I end up at an ashram. I meet a mystic. I have a mystical type experience. Then I come home. I'm sucked back into society because I'm trying to build my health business. So I couldn't really go into the spiritual realms like I wanted to. And I felt like I needed to make a living, you know. I could have easily just stayed at the ashram and continued. But I didn't. I came home and helped people with their health. And did what I thought I was supposed to do. And then eventually, doubling down on my spiritual practice. And then more mystical experiences started happening. And in a blink of an eye, my mentor is gone. Vanished. So yeah, I don't I don't know how he would feel about me talking about him on a recording. I've thought about turning the emails into a book. I don't know what he would think about it, but then again, well, I can't ask him. He's gone. <laughs> well, maybe I just need to be silent longer. What a role model. A walking billboard of inner potential and what we can become. Forget your outer life for just a second. Forget your bank account or your cars or your house or even your relationships. Your inner life inside has more potential than you can ever imagine. And he was a walking example of that. If you look up what a blue antelope is, you'll find that it was a real species that is now extinct. I think it's only right that you now hear from him. If you pass beyond the body, and reach the spirit, you will have reached the newly arrived thing. Al-Haq, the real, is eternal. How can a newly arrived thing find the eternal? What does dust have to do with the Lord of the Lords? In your view, that which through you leap up and become free is the spirit. But if you offer the spirit to the beloved, what have you done? 
If your lovers bring the gift of the Spirit to you, by your head, O my beloved, they have brought salt water to the ocean. The beloved has no needs. You take need to the beloved. Come in need. The beloved who has no needs loves to be needed. By means of this need, all at once, you will, you will leap from the midst of these newly arrived things. Something from the eternal will join with you. And that is love. Love's snare will come and you will be caught by it. For they love Allah is the trace of Allah loves them. Through the eternal you will see the eternal. And Allah perceives the eyes. This is the entirety of words that can never be completed. Until the day of resurrection they will not be completed. What can you give to that which is everything? Nothing. Just be a vessel for its love and enjoy the blessings of love. For what greater purpose has this world been created for? Madalun janati lati valiral muntagu Behan harum imma in gari asin Valan harum milla valnilam Yatalga yandal mu Valan harum min Translation A simile of the garden of paradise Which those who keep their duty are promised Therein are rivers of water unpolluted and rivers of milk whereof the flavor changeth not and rivers of clear run honey. Therein is every kind of fruit with pardon from their Lord. If you hear words coming through a wall, you know that wall isn't speaking. And that voice belongs to someone else. The saints are like this. They have died before death and have become like doors and walls. Not even a hair's tip of separate existence remains in them. In the hands of reality, they are shields. But the shield doesn't move under its own power. Thus, the saints say, Anal haq, I am the truth, meaning I am nothing at all. I move by the hand of Allah. Look upon such shields as Allah. My master said, someone was weeping that, that, the, that the Tartars killed his brother. Oh, he was such a man of knowledge. My master said to him, if you have knowledge, you would know that with the strike of that sword, the Tartar gave him endless life. But what do the dead or dead preachers know about life? They come up to the pulpit and they begin a lamentation. I mean, the prophet, peace be upon him, he said, this world is the prison of the believer. Someone escapes from prison and then you weep for him. What a pity, he escaped from prison. <laughs> Please, the Tartars, see, or oh, some other cause made a hole in that prison. He escaped. He was transferred from one abode to another. Then you weep. Someone joins with the beloved and you weep for him, but you don't weep for yourself. If you were aware of your own state, you would weep for yourself. 
Rather, you would gather all your people together, all your relatives, and you would lament and anguish for yourself. There is no change in the beloved. The change is in you. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.